This is a lecture for my professional responsibility class. We're going to be talking about model rule 1.10, which is about the imputation of conflicts of interest and screening out a lawyer uh, from the rest of the firm to help resolve the problem of imputed conflicts. So um, this video, we're going to break this rule into to two videos. I'm going to go through the rule because it, it has a long rambling set of provisions um, in one video and then talk about the ABA's official comments in the follow-up video in part two. So imputation um, is addressed in 1.10. And if you're watching these videos in order for my class, you may remember that at the end of um, model rule 1.8, there was a provision in section K about imputation of the, the conflicts just in rule 1.8. Um, about the personal conflicts of the lawyer applying. Note that um, in 1.10a, we're talking about imputing uh, 1.7 conflicts and 1.9 conflicts. So these are conflicts from clients. 1.7 would be current clients, and 1.9 would be your former clients. Okay, so let's proceed. A, while lawyers are associated in a firm, none of them shall knowingly represent a client when any one of them practicing alone would be prohibited from doing so by rules 1.7 or 1.9 unless and here's how we fix this one the prohibition is based on a personal interest of the disqualified lawyer and does not present a significant risk of materially limiting the representation of the client by the remaining lawyers in the firm or Two, the prohibition is based on rule 1.9a or b. Remember that that's 1.9a is about switching sides. <clears throat> You're representing the opposing party in a matter that you've already been working on. And b is about changing firms and arises out of the disqualified lawyer's association with a prior firm. And one, the disqualified lawyer is timely screened from any participation in the matter and apportioned no part of the fee therefrom. Little two, written notice is promptly given to any affected former client to enable the former client to ascertain compliance with the provisions of this rule and shall include a description of the screening procedures employed, a statement of the firm's and the screen lawyer's compliance with these rules, a statement that review may be available before a tribunal, and an agreement by the firm to respond promptly to any written inquiries or objections by the former client about the screening procedures and certifications of compliance with these rules and with the screening procedures <clears throat> are provided to the former client by the screen lawyer and by a partner of the firm at reasonable intervals upon the former client's written request and upon termination of the screening procedures. <clears throat> B, when a lawyer has terminated an association with the firm, the firm is not prohibited from thereafter representing a person with interests materially adverse to those of a client represented by the formerly associated lawyer and not currently represented by the firm unless, one, the matter is the same or substantially related to that in which the formerly associated lawyer represented the client and any lawyer remaining in the firm has information protected by rules 1.6 and 1.9c that is material to this matter. C, the disqualification prescribed by this rule may be waived by the affected client under conditions stated in Rule 1.7, and D, the disqualification of lawyers associated in a firm with former or um, current government lawyers is governed by Rule 1.11. So let's go back for just a moment and kind of talk about what is this mumbo jumbo talking about. So um, first, um, A1 talks about a personal interest of the disqualified lawyer. And here's our kind of classic scenario. <clears throat> you have someone come to um, the, the firm you're working for as a prospective client, and it is your ex, your ex who you had hoped to never see again the rest of your life, not your friendly ex, the ex that you thought about getting a restraining order again, ex. And so there's no way that you want to be this person's lawyer. And or, or frankly, you really shouldn't be involved with being them a, a, their lawyer at all. So uh, under 1.7, we would have called this a material limitation, right? So um, you have a personal history. 
or it could be that this person um, cheated you or defrauded you. It could be someone who um, <clears throat> uh, reported you for uh, for something and 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 ruined your life for a little while and uh, all sorts of things. In an earlier video, I told a story about how I was um, had a, a two family house for a while and and had a tenant who was this complete nightmare tenant and finally moved out. And then years later, I was working at a legal aid clinic and that very person um, showed up again wanting representation because uh, they were being evicted from uh, another uh, home. And so where they had dwelled and they had been a nightmare tenant for that person. And so the uh, so I wouldn't, I have a personal history or personal conflict of interest. That would be a material limitation. I mentioned when I told that story before that another lawyer um, could represent uh, another lawyer, and, and that's what exactly what happened. They just gave the case to somebody else in the firm, and then I stayed out of it. I didn't talk to the person about it. I didn't ask for updates on what was going on. I didn't try to influence um, the representation at all or anything like that. And so um, that would be uh, applicable here. So if it's a personal interest of the disqualified lawyer, and um, and I, there's no risk that I'm going to have any influence on the other lawyers in the firm, then one of them could proceed with a representation. So if otherwise, though, it would be imputed to the whole firm. And so if I'm someone, if I have one of these larger than life personalities and I domineer everyone in the firm, um, I'm totally overbearing so that anybody who represents an old enemy of mine is really going to pay for it. Um, and you know that there's people like that, right? So um, in that situation, then there would be a material limitation. So that's the first part. Now, um, two is where it really gets interesting because this is about screening. And here we're talking about a lawyer who previously worked on a matter. And it could be, for example, that you are at a firm, you graduated from law school and went to work for a firm. And um, early on, you, you worked on a, a certain case and you were the only person in that firm who worked on that client's matter and it was a simple matter um, and so forth. And then um, the representation ended. They fired you or, or something like that. And now um, the firm uh, it has been approached by the opposing party from that very transaction um, and wants to represent the opposing party. Well, as you may remember, if you watched the lecture on 1.9, um, a, that's exactly what 1.9 would normally prohibit if it's the same lawyer. But what if it's a firm? Yes, we impute your conflict to the whole firm unless we can isolate you out and kind of create this like co zone of separation uh, and, and uh, almost like ostracism um, uh, of the disqualified lawyer. Um, and then we could uh, proceed, someone else in the firm could represent the person. Um, 1.9b, you may remember, is uh, you worked on a matter at a previous firm, and this was a client of the previous firm, and it could be that you um, did some work for them, and now you know a lot of confidential information, or it could be that you were at one of these firms where everybody, talk, they, they all get together and they talk about all of their cases, so you actually know all of the deep, dark secrets of the opposing party because you were there, and so um, in other words, there's a party out there who um, you know the goods on them and now you've switched firms and you have moved to the firm that's representing the opposing party um, in the same matter or even a different matter, but the information you have would be relevant. And in that case, we need to isolate you and we're going to screen you, which means you don't get it. You're not going to be allowed to participate. No one is allowed. So here's what we mean by screening. You don't get to participate in the matter. You have to leave the room um, if they're discussing it in a meeting. And um, everyone else is supposed to be careful not to talk to you about it, not to ask questions, and not even friendly chit chat like, hey, what's going on with that case that I know a lot about or something like that. Um, no, and no surreptitiously like leaving files out in the lunchroom that other, so that you're sharing information or other people kind of sharing information on you to keep you posted on what's going on because of your history with this um, case and, and your morbid curiosity or something like that. We mean it's off limits. 
um, at a sophisticated law practice or, or law office, they will have the IT people actually probably disable like your access or block your access to the files on the firm's network about that case. That would be a nice measure. I'm not saying everyone does that, but ideally you should not have like an easy, like one, one or two clicks away access from um, reading the confidential information and so forth or interfering in the matter. So you're gonna leave the room, nobody talks to you, you don't talk to them, no questions and so forth. If the firm gets a windfall of fees, guess who doesn't get a share? You, right? Because you don't get to profit from the case because you have a conflict of interest. Now, this doesn't mean we're going to dock your pay if you have a set salary already. It doesn't mean we're going to dock your end of the year bonus if you build a gazillion hours. So we're not talking about that, but we are talking about things where there's a huge chunk of fees and it's clear that we're dividing this up among the fir everybody in the firm. And occasionally I'll see this, a small plaintiff's firm, for example, wins like a $30 million or $100 million um, uh, verdict. They get all of a sudden the, that firm has $30 million in contingent fees from one case and they were already doing pretty well and covering their overhead. Well, they tend to distribute that to everybody. Uh, you know, it's harvest time, right, at the firm, but not for you right? You don't get anything. And so uh, that's the first thing. And then we have this, rat, this, this sort of list of complex notice. You're going to notify the former client. By the way, we have a guy at our firm who used to work for your firm and we are screening him. And notice timely, you don't get to sit down with a person and say, okay, quick, tell me everything you know about the case before we start our screening. If we find that, we're going to disqualify the firm if they cheated. Timely means before any information was shared, like immediately. And so we're gonna tell them, we don't have to ask their permission. Please note, this is, very, this is a crucial difference between um, 1.10 and some of our prior uh, conflicts rules. There's nothing in 1.10 about getting consent uh, from the other client and or consent confirmed in writing from the former client. Here, we're just telling them, we have a lawyer here, but it's nothing to worry about because we have isolated that person from this case. We have no, everyone has been instructed, everyone in the firm, and that's part of screening. The management instructs everyone in the firm, including the support staff, don't talk to attorney Stevenson about this case and don't ask him any questions and shut him down if he tries to tell you anything and so forth. So they're all on notice and you're gonna tell them, we did that and we did that, we're blocking him from the files on the network and so forth. And if you don't trust us, you can ask for a hearing before a tribunal and we'll submit evidence and testimony and affidavits and so forth. Um, and we promise that we are, this is what we're going to do and we hereby certify and swear Scott's honor, Scout's honor that we're gonna do it. And then we will respond to inquiries. If at some point a year from now, the litigation is still going on and you feel nervous, like maybe that attorney Stevenson has started blabbing stuff to people, um, we can. Uh, you can you can ask for us to uh, go on the record again and and officially certify that we're not going to do it. That's two, and then three is we're going to certify if it goes on for a long time. Periodically, we will recertify that we are still screening that lawyer, that disqualified lawyer. And when it's all the representation is all over, we're going to kind of close the book with a farewell letter. By the way, this matter is over, and we did what we said. We screened that lawyer. And so that's screening um, in a nutshell that you need to know. And this is very important. Now, here's a couple other quick things that I have to say about this rule. <clears throat> By the way, uh, as you may remember, remember there is a B. And um, B is for the firm that you left. The B is for the firm that you left. So you worked for a firm after law school. Five years out, you leave and go to another firm. Um, and you take your client with you. You take your client with you. They follow you to your new firm. Great. Can your old firm start representing the opposing party? Can your old firm start representing the opposing party after you leave and you take your client with you? And the answer is yes. Um, unless, but not on the same case, right? So, they're, they're, so can uh, so they can they represent the opposing party in that matter? No, but 
next year when somebody else is suing that client that was a client of the firm last year but has moved on with the lawyer, can they represent um, somebody that's the opposing party? Um, yes, because they don't have anyone left in that firm who was actually handling the representation. But we also have to make sure that nobody in that firm has confidential information. So this isn't one of these firms where you told everybody. There are firms where the lawyers don't know what each of uh, the other lawyers are generally doing. So if anybody has confidential or prejudicial information, then that would disqualify the firm going forward from suing a former client who is now being represented by another firm. <clears throat> now you can waive this. I said there's nothing here about consent and, and stuff like that. That's right, because we can screen and we can just tell them we're screening. On the other hand, they can just waive the screening. So in that sense, a C does incorporate the informed consent from 1.7. It is a backup option under 1.10. And then don't worry about government lawyers, we have a special rule. And that brings us to our closing comments about this. Um, rule 111 was actually the long-standing rule. It was passed first to make it easier for government lawyers to enter the private sector, private sector lawyers to enter government work so that um, we didn't want people to be afraid if they went to work for the government as a lawyer, like the DA's office or the Department of Justice or something like that, that they would be stuck there for their whole career and never able to go to the private sector. So we created screening really for government lawyers. And really only about 10 years ago or 11 years ago from the time I'm making this video, did we adopt Rule 1.10 and apply, allow screening for just lateral moves between private firms. And so um, it, this made it, by the way, I hope you can see that 1.10, the screening is very convenient and makes it easier for firms to hire lateral lawyers, lawyers, experienced lawyers from another firm, without having to fret too much about the conflicts of interest that they bring with them. Because if a conflict arises from their prior work, we'll, we will just screen the lawyer. Um, uh, from the matter now. And now we are going to need to know, uh, and we'll talk about this later, all the cases that they worked on and who the clients were and so forth. So we know when to screen them and we can do it in time. So it's timely screening. There's another thing we need to say about this that there's just no real like delicate way to, I, don't, I really don't know how to say it with, um, uh, gently, but we used to call this something else. And <clears throat> in the old days, um, my, let's say my parents' generation, um, they called screening lawyers with, with conflicts of interest um, having a Chinese wall, having a Chinese wall around the lawyer. We don't call it that anymore. You should not call it that anymore. You should call it screening the lawyer. The ABA calls it screening the lawyer. Why am I mentioning this to you? Because after law school, a lot of graduates are gonna be working for people who graduated a long time ago. And, um, and when they went to law school in the first decades of their practice, everybody called this um, having a Chinese wall um, uh, around the lawyer who has the conflict of interest. If you have to do uh, research when you have an uh, uncertain, I hope you can see there's some ambiguity in the rule about when you have to do this. The, like what counts as a material limitation. And so you're looking up old cases or old ethics opinions and the, case, the courts called it a Chinese wall. This has nothing to do with the Great Wall of China. This is about those, um, those folding room partitions. So you may have seen um, these things that are kind of wood frames and they're hinged and there's like three or four sections of them and they're often covered with parchment paper and maybe have a pretty watercolor painting or calligraphy on them or something like that. And these are sort of portable room partitions. You set them up and because they're a little bit, they're hinged and zigzag a little bit, they're freestanding. And in the 1970s, these started to become, these were kind of introduced into our pop culture um, it, having previously been seen mostly in Asian restaurants. And people liked them because if you had an open floor plan house, like an open floor ranch um, or a studio apartment, it was a way to kind of create a subdivide, a big open room um, into little area, separate areas, like an eating area and a living area. And that's all very nice. And some of you are like, holy cow, I wish he would get back to legal ethics. Um, 
Well, I want you to think about, though, that there was something about this. Um, those partitions are visual barriers. They're portable. You don't have to, like, bring in a, con a contractor and do renovations and stuff like that. On the other hand, can you overhear the conversation on the other side of one of those paper barriers? Of course you can, right? So if you're trying to eavesdrop, you can. And so maybe when they called it, a and that's what they were referring to when they called it a Chinese wall. It was something that you could temporarily kind of quarantine a lawyer from information about a case. But for some people, there was a little bit of a like, yeah, like we don't really believe you that the lawyer can't hear anything because if you're working in a firm, you can overhear conversations in the hallway. You pick things up. If you really wanted to find out about a case or um, wanted to tell somebody something about the case, you probably could. And so it's not really a, a perfect barrier. Again, I need just need to say that because you will hear old, um, attorneys who went to law school a long time ago um, and judges and people like that call it a Chinese wall. And definitely if you're reading old ethics opinions or court cases, they call it a Chinese wall. You should call it screening. On the NPR, it's going to be called screening. On my exam and in my class, it's going to be called screening. That's what we call it now. Here's our review question. Hopefully you can guess this. If a lawyer at a firm has a conflict of interest with a firm's prospective new client, may other lawyers in the firm represent the client instead? A, yes, as long as the lawyer in the conflict is screened in time. Or B, no, because the lawyer's conflicts of interest will impute to the rest of the firm. Hopefully you know the answer to that question. This was supposed to be kind of easy. And if you don't, you really should review the um, video.